Proverbs 9 is kind of like a recap of what we've read so far in Proverbs, if you look at it. It covers a lot of the same ground we've covered. Let's look at this, and then we'll get to the Revelation chapter 8, which really is kind of a downer, so let's let this Proverbs chapter 9 really be the uplift. I say downer, but and by the time you get to Revelation chapter 8, uh, the world deserves what it gets, and God's wrath is perfectly called for. But I didn't mean to say that contrary. Let's look at Proverbs 9, though. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. We're talking about building homes on Friday night. This is a passage we'll probably look at sometime. Talking about the house of wisdom, how it's built, what it offers. The seven pillars, supposedly, I guess, I'm no architect, but a seven pillar home is kind of, was kind of a standard back in those days for a strong home, I guess. Got some head nods here from folks who either know their stuff or live back in those times. It could be one of the two. I'm not sure. Uh, Killed her beast, hath mingled her wine. She's also furnished her table. Where the house of wisdom is, is sustenance, is provision for your life, feeding, feasting at the table of wisdom. Three, she hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth out upon the high places of the city. We know wisdom from the Lord is screaming out in the streets. We've covered that. It's not hard to find. It's slapping you in the face usually. It's us trying to ignore wisdom. That is the problem. It's not God hiding wisdom in some deep, high mountain top. I should say deep uh, cavern or crevice or cave or on top of some high mountain top. God makes it readily available. It's in the pages of Scripture, preserved over time perfectly for us. But still, we don't find it many times or we don't believe it. Six. I don't know if I read. No, I didn't. I didn't read four. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Those who find wisdom, it says there, whoso is simple. To find wisdom takes a heart that says, I don't know everything. Really? That's what it takes. A humble heart looking for intelligence greater than your own, wisdom far exceeding your own. That, well, that's what makes wisdom a hard thing to reach for smart people, right? Or well-to-do people, well-off, quick-witted. I don't know. You think you're smart, you're less inclined to say, Lord, I need answers, right? You think of problem solvers. And the, the word problems, or the phrase problem solver is like a good thing, isn't it? In this world, I don't know, I'm a problem solver. Put it on your resume, okay? But if you think you're really a problem solver in life and you've got that skill set, watch yourself that you then don't ask God to solve your problems. You might be solving problems in all the wrong ways, all the short-term ways. The simple cry out for wisdom. The simple turn in. Don't be too smart for wisdom. Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Six, forsake the foolish and live, and go on the way of understanding. Those who find wisdom, or we could say to find wisdom, we have to forsake foolishness quite often. To find the wise path, you have to forsake the foolish path, right? To find the wise answer, then get rid of your loser answer that you've been holding on to. And go on the way of wisdom. I think it's really true. Those who find some good wisdom are often those who are forsaken some other things that have just been their norm, their standard, grew up this way, it's always a part of me, or just never thought I needed to pray about it, kind of thing, right? Never thought I needed to pray about this relationship. That could easily mean people, right? Forsake the foolish, just like it says. Seven. It is kind of a a switch in topics. From 1 to 6, we see the house of wisdom, all that it can offer you, how to get into it. I think the house of wisdom is just, it's an abstract concept. The house of wisdom can be a mouth. It can be your homes that you're building right now. A house of wisdom can be a church, right? Wherever wisdom dwells. And that's where people turn in to hear wisdom. Hopefully our church is a house of wisdom because we let the Bible come out of it. 
But look at seven. He that reproveth a scorner getteth himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. We covered this earlier. I think it was even chapter one. I think. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Inside seven and eight, you really see the dangers of ministry. Isn't it the truth? The and I don't just mean me as a pastor, a preacher in a church. I mean the danger of ministering for God. The stakes are these. You offer wisdom from the Word of God. People aren't going to be real neutral about it. People are really going to like it, love it, latch on to it, and thereby latch on to you. And you will win. You will. Like I think I preached a while ago, you'll win some friends that are hard to shake when that's the reason that they, that that's the thing they like about you, right? But you also can make a lot of people hate you, right? Because you give them wisdom or you present wisdom through Scripture and they turn away from it. I've seen it already in my life and in this ministry. I don't even understand it sometimes. But we've got people here tonight and I expect that you um, have love for me like I have for you. I suspect that to be the case. But I've also seen the flip side. I've, I've, in my life, I don't think, I've never had like an out-out -out argument with hardly anybody. I can't remember it. An argument with somebody or a confrontation, same words, but I just mean like, like an ugly confrontation or an ongoing ne nemesis. I haven't had those kinds of things, but I've had people do really, really hateful things and say really, really hateful things that seemingly, seemingly out of nowhere. You know, even people who have left our church in our small history, who they left on what I thought were good terms and praying for you, I hope you, you know, hope works out for you. It wasn't even ugly departures, but then years later, they expressed hate and contempt. And I, most recently, I said, it's, it sounds like your argument is with God, right? Hating some sort of truth that was presented, some sort of wisdom. But that's the business we're in. We keep preaching, we're going to have real dramatic reactions from our friends. You guys have experienced it. Can't keep them. You're going to keep preaching wisdom. They're either going to hold to it or they're going to hate it. There it says what they are, though. A wise person will hear rebuke. A scorner will and cast it from him. It really will be the difference between our relationships and our church, good ones, bad ones, is the ability to give sound wisdom and receive sound wisdom, right? If we don't, we will just walk down a path with a sure outcome, which is a departing of ways, which is animosity between two parties without fail. That will, that's what destroys relationships and even can destroy ministries if you don't uh, follow the Bible's plan for scorners. Let's come back. We'll come back to what, to what wisdom looks like. Let's look at that word scorner real quick. We've got some time tonight. Look at oh, Proverbs 1, 22. We've looked at a lot of words closely in Proverbs. Let's look at how scorners used. It's used a number of times um, not as much early. It's only used like one time, once or twice early in the book. By early, I mean pre-chapter 8. Look at one twenty-two. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. We talked about what scorning is by definition. We called it disdain. We called it mocking. We called it... Uh, I forget what else, contempt for somebody, expressing of content and disrespect. That's scorn. It says there that scorners delight in scorning. Right? You find yourself delighting in saying something that's kind of mocking. Delighting in saying something that's disrespectful, borderline disrespectful. Delighting in scorning. Then I think you're, you're earning a table called, or, or earning a title called scorner. Right? And I don't deny that all of us can have scornful words. Even our example tonight where Evelyn said something wrong, a little kid, Evelyn, and we all laugh kind of heartily and almost too much. You can make them feel bad. Right there is borderline scorn, <laughs> scorning. But once I bring it up, I think most of us are like, oh, yeah, I better be careful. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Okay? A scorner's mindset is, actually, I don't mind if they felt bad. <laughs> That's kind of why I was doing it. That's a scorner's mindset. Okay. It says it also in 14 and verse 6. Verse 
14.6, a scorner seeketh wisdom, and findeth it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. The scorner, in his life, his disdain, his mock, and his, his enjoyment thereof, he may seek some wisdom, but he doesn't find it. I don't know why he doesn't find it. Must not really want it. Maybe God's not showing it to him. Maybe he doesn't want to overcome his scorning because he enjoys it, just like he doesn't want to overcome sins because he enjoys them. The scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. When your heart is right with God, understanding truth is easy. Not hard, right? Your heart is not right with God, then you struggle with some very simple concepts oftentimes. It's the truth. Look at chapter 15, verse 12. The scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Yeah. The scorner's mindset is not to go near somebody who might touch on something he's guilty of, touch on something he just doesn't want to talk about, wasn't want to bring up, rather keep under the rug. The scorner is not that. Let's have it out in the open kind of person. Let's talk this through. We have a disagreement. Let's find common ground. Let's find the right answer. Iron sharpens iron. They're not they're as bold as a lie in the scorner's not. The scorner is, let's just keep making sideways comments until the cows come home. Sideways, disrespectful, mocking kind of comments because I'm mad about something, but it's not worth it to me to bring it up to you to get it right because I'd rather just be mad about something. I think we've all um, seen scorning probably in our own lives, for sure in our own lives. But it's not a good place to be. The mindset of a scorner is not a helpful one. Scorning is, if you can think about scorning, it's probably about the opposite of edifying. Edifying is saying something that you want that would help the person. Scorning, saying something that you um, want to bring the person down or get personal satisfaction out of it. You're saying, Logan, you're going way too much on scorning. Well, I bring it up because I don't think our church is immune of it, immune from it, and I don't think um, we are now or will be in the future. Scorning comes up, and scorning causes problems. It'll say here, look at it, 1925. Look what the Bible's answer for scorners is. 1925. It's only a good year, 1925. Smite a scorner, and the simple will beware, and reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. Okay? So like in a church setting, we're not going to get a, a stick out and swipe people, whack people. But in biblical terms, it is valuable to rebuke a scorner. It's valuable to show that, hey, this person is all about mocking or disrespect or disdain or whatever it may be, it's actually biblical to shut that person up or to make a little public example of, no, we don't do that. Kind of like my example about the classroom, right? A rule breaker is bad, but a rule challenger, a rule, um, yeah, a rule challenger or a rule mocker is poison for a class in simple terms. It makes sense, right? It's poison. You say, Logan, this is, how, this is how cults are started when they don't allow free speech among the congregation. Everyone's got to be quiet and just submit like a, like a kid's class. This is how cults are started. Well, there's a difference between speaking freely and scorning. The difference between ironing, sharpening iron and scorning. There's a difference between edifying or asking honest questions or making honest comments and scorning. There's just a difference. That's what I'm saying. Okay. 1925, we saw that. It, let's read the last part, though. It says, We beware and reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. It helps other people when we say that actually no scorning is not a good thing. Look at 21, 24. Think about what we do when we scorn. We need to be careful with our mouths because you reap what you sow, and if you are in any sort of position of leadership anywhere in your life, you will respect the concept of respect. You know what I mean? You say, Logan, you're doing all this because you're a pastor and you want us to respect your authority. Right, now, don't talk about that yet. Um, 
Okay, it's not about that, but you, we should all appreciate the idea of respecting authority, shouldn't we? Because in the room we have mothers and we have fathers and we have people in the workplace, we have people serving in the church. We should appreciate the concept of respect for something, okay? where it's, where it's um, called for. When someone undermines respect, red flags should go up and be like, okay, is there a really good reason for this to happen? I mean, is it really, was it really called for to undermine someone's authority in public or undermine someone's authority in any public um, setting or venue? Was there good reason for it? There better be good reason because if not, then you are undermining an authority structure that can break down on all kinds of levels. When you get home then and you're asking your five-year-old to respect you, <laughs> God may give us some taste of our own medicine. God works like that too, by the way. God is not beyond using our children to teach us how we act. Who can say amen to that, right? I've got three boys, and they all act like angels, so I see how good I am in them. It's really helpful, because I'm low confidence sometimes, and it just picks... I'm just talking nonsense. You know I'm talking nonsense. Don't laugh too hard at that, about the whole nonsense. <laughs> 20, that's scorning! 21, 24. He that followeth after righteousness... Wait, I'm not sure that's one. 21, 24, excuse me. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. Yeah, I think scorning and pride are cousins. Hard to have one without the other. You've got a prideful heart. Scorning will come, will come out. If you have scorning coming out of your mouth, you probably have a prideful heart. They go together in wrath, in bitterness. Scorning comes out. It's better to get past all that, right? It should be no scorning. We'll talk about husbands and wives on Sunday night. And I, I know scorning can come up there in both directions for sure. But there's no reason to keep it a part of your conversation. There's no reason to keep it. It shows, an underlying, it shows that there's an underlying wound there or underlying crack in the, in the fabric of your home. It's not good. It shows that there's underlying cracks in the fabric uh, or tears in the fabric of our church. Everything okay? Someone want to go check it out? If anybody's downstairs, we're sending our... This guy knows jujitsu. He knows taekwondo. He, 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 um, seven, he can speak seven languages. <laughs> if he dies, it was a good sacrifice. No, I just mean for him. It's like a martyr's crown died in the church basement. That's great. Four. Okay, let's go on. 22, 10. 22, 10. See anything down there? The ghost. Could be a ghost. <clears throat> Here's the one, 22, 10, that shows, okay, so, so it, we already saw you should rebuke a scorner. There's reason for that, so it doesn't spread like wildfire. And then 22, 10 says, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Right? We see in the New Testament big reasons to not have someone once named among you. Right, remember that passage, fornication and uncleanness and the drunkard. I can't remember the list there, list there um, but to put them out for mem membership. You could make a case, though, that if someone really was just a scorning kind of person, a scorning mouth, and they weren't getting over it, I think you could have a church. A church could have biblical grounds to say, hey, this, is, this is not working out. Not, this is not good for us. Okay? Because it, it ties with the scorning concept. Scorning ties with the leaven concept. Right? And a good, a good stewards of a local church will be careful about that. So at this time, I want to go ahead and vote Patrick out, if we can get some show of hands. We can do secret ballot. No, but really, look at that. Cast out a scorner and contention shall go out, yea, strife and reproach shall cease. It shows that there's a dramatic remedy for scorning, because there's a dramatic need with scorning. But you know what that shows? Is that scorning is very dangerous for relationships. For instance, you can't cast out your wife because she's scorning. You can't cast out your husband because they're scorning. Uh, you, you can't do that. You've got to stay together. But it shows how hard it is to live. And in church, you don't want to cast anybody out. It's hard enough to get people to join churches. You know what I mean? But this would go to show that scorning can be that dangerous that, we might, that you might have to go to such a level.
And that's something else. The concept of scorn, it's, it's, it's a big one. Look at last verse on this topic, 24.9, then we'll move on. 24.9, the thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. It doesn't necessarily say an abomination to God, though I don't think God's happy with it. But it says an abomination to men. Um, could mean of men, of course, with men. It could mean the, kind of, the same kind of thought. But I take a little bit to mean the abomination to men is that it's hard to deal with scorners, <laughs> right? Hard to be with, hard to love and to grow with and to latch onto and souls knit together when someone mocks you or or has shows contempt for you, disdain, isn't it the truth? It's really true. It can set a relationship back. Relationships built on, or with that as a part of it, they're never going to get too deep. I think I've seen that in my past. Adults, where one adult just has kind of a scorning attitude about everything, and I'm not going to name any kind of names, but has kind of a scornful attitude about everything and everyone. And I never see this person really develop good, solid relationships because everyone knows you really got to watch what you do with this guy. He's just going to mock you about something. Or he's... Okay. Let's go back to our text. Proverbs 9. We'll get through the chapter. We'll get to Revelation. But like I said, Revelation is pretty heavy. <sighs> talk about the news all night. I don't want to talk about the news. I'd rather talk about the Bible. You know what I mean? Sometimes on Sunday mornings, I think God tells me to preach about news a little bit, current events. <laughs> it's so much, it's, it's needful to rebuke what we see in the world, right? But there's peace just learning the truth, right? Isn't there peace? Knowing what's true, what's not going to change on us. What I was trying to, you know, Sunday is, is trying to point people back to the Bible with the wind and waves around us, and I hope that's what we've done, but Proverbs 9, look down here, verse uh, 9. <clears throat> Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Make the wise wiser. These are those who can hear rebuke. The wise get wiser. Uh, the foolish get just more foolish. Can't hear rebuke. You're, you're not even wise at all, and you're going backwards. You really start growing as a Christian when you become that person that can receive admonishment. I think it's so true. You can receive admonishment from your personal walk with the Lord and your devotions. Admonishment, I need to change, I need to grow, I need to be stronger here. And you can receive admonishment in your church from your brothers and sisters. Those are the people who get wiser. There's a huge arms gap. I don't know. The difference between those who can receive admonishment and get wiser, your technology and wisdom is so far advanced, it's like comparing the United States, I don't know, to some backward nation in the middle of uh, African jungle as far as technology goes. You get the reference? You get way behind because you're not growing at all. If, if we can receive admonishment, we can grow. A key for all of this, a key for the house of wisdom, a key for receiving admonishment, a key for not being a scorner, is absolutely back in 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. It's the truth. Theme verse in Proverbs, I would say, is that one, or way back in 1.7 when it said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. And how we can teach it. That's some of what Sunday's sermons, I think, are supposed to bring out. Fear of the Lord a little bit. That's some of definitely what Revelation can teach us. The fear of the Lord. It is a great remedy. The Bible says, uh, there's a verse that says, Unite our hearts to fear the Lord. Didn't we cover that? Was that in our psalm, psalm? I can't remember. We can pray for God to increase our faith and increase our fear of Him. We can pray for these things. And we should. We need wisdom. And different versions and different preachers have really turned that fear of the Lord into, they have, I see it in multiple Bibles, reverential trust increase my reverential trust for the Lord it's not the same it's not the same 
You'll see that in the book of Revelation, okay? When you read in Revelation, you don't get a whole big sense of reverential trust. Okay? You get a sense for he's a righteous God, his wrath is going to fall. It falls on uh, the rebellious, disobedient, those who reject him, it certainly does. Fear of the Lord is not simply reverential trust. Don't get that wrong in your head. He is a consuming fire. Go ahead, Brett. Fear is pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. Fear of the Lord. It means exactly what it says. It means just what it says. Okay, there's a, if we want to ever look at that path, there's a lot of verses that talk about fearing God, exactly what it is. There's no argument. Let's look over here at, um, no, let's finish chapter, I'm sorry. 10. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. Fear the Lord. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself. But if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. It talks about wisdom, and it uses wisdom as a female. She, 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 right? And then here at the end, it talks about this foolish, the foolishness example of a woman. And it's just like a chapter earlier, but let's watch this. The foolish example. 14, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. So this lady called foolishness does the same thing that the lady called wisdom does, and that's called for people, hey, 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 look at me. Come down my path. Come down my way. So specifically, this will get into kind of example of immorality. But like I preached it in the earlier chapter, it's the same concept. Foolishness cries out to people. And the simple says in verse 16, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Foolishness tempts us with the idea that this is going to be exciting, this is going to be fun, this is going to be um, enriching and lively. Um, doing something that you're not supposed to do. There's a sense of uh, excitement around getting away with something that's wrong. Rebellion, a lie, deceit, pride. Sins are always fun, but the pleasures of sin are only for a season. 18, but he that knoweth not, that the, excuse me, but he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. The guests at the house of foolishness are dead. <laughs> They've died. They've gone to hell. The difference between the house of wisdom and the house of foolishness is brought out pretty clearly in this chapter, isn't it? We should surely cling to that house of wisdom. We should surely fear God and get away from this house of foolishness. It's really true. I don't think we need to say much more. The differences between life and death. What do people do, though? We read this chapter in an Old Testament book around 1000 B.C. 3,000 years ago, this was written. A key chapter. We all read it tonight. Easy to understand, right, Pat? But what house do most people go to? Think about that and think over. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Sitting here tonight, it's easy. Oh, we're not going to go to the one with the dead people and the hell. Uh, hell no. Right? But what do people do in their lives? They choose scorning. They choose mocking the truth. They choose mocking true wisdom. They choose the sin because it's fun for a season. And then in Matthew 7, Jesus gives us the final score. 7.13 Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Jesus says, most people go to the house of foolishness. Place of hell and death. 14 Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Few go to the house of wisdom. Trust in the Savior, live the biblical way. Few go that way. A lot of it comes back to scorning. 
well, you think you're so smart because you're going this way, but I'm not going to listen to you. You think you got a corner on the truth. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm a smart person too. I don't need to respect you. I don't need to do this. That's kind of cultic for me to think that someone else has got some sort of wisdom or authority over me. I got in a whole other direction picked out in my life. In a thousand different words, people make that decision to scorn the way of truth, to scorn God's way. So we should be mindful of scorn in our own hearts because we see it in life. We see it around those uh, of us, people we love that are going to hell. It's because they scorn the truth. Okay. Jesus gives us the final tally. Most people go the wrong way. Let's go to Revelation. Saying, Logan, this is a real pick-me-up tonight, isn't it? Well, you're not going to hell, are you? You trusted Christ as your Savior. And you feared God, which is the beginning of wisdom. And the Lord blesses those that fear Him. The Lord gives wisdom to people who fear Him. The Lord gives a wonderful life to those who obey. <laughs> I was listening to... If you ever want to get charged up about the ministry and how not to preach, I was listening to a sermon from Joel Osteen. <laughs> and he is just so good at convincing people to scorn the truth. He's so good at leading people to the house of destruction without saying that he is, <laughs> making them feel so comfortable. It's really quite a talent, a rare talent. When they made Joel Olstein, some very talented demon said, hey, we've got this whole people thing figured out, right? We've been watching for a few thousand years. We know exactly what this guy needs to say in a 20-minute sermon to really make people just relax, <laughs> think, they're calm. Think everything's good. This Bible is what it is. It says, says I am. I don't know what else he says, but he is polished. I want you to listen to him tonight. He's really good. <laughs> he was making a case about grace, which he's wrong. It's Calvinistic thinking. It's because of God's grace that you are obeying the Bible. Now don't knock other people because they haven't received God's grace like you have. Right? You get it? It's really, really deep demonic, isn't it? How can you judge somebody who hasn't received that gift to obey God? Right? We shouldn't judge anybody because, I mean, good grief. It's a, it's, the Calvinists should actually applaud, applaud with that sermon because, yeah, God's sovereign. He even chooses the drunkard to get drunk. He chooses the sodomite to be the sodomite. Not true. We revolt against God. And so if you choose to disobey God, you can choose to obey God. And yes, we need help. We pray for God's strength all the time because it doesn't come naturally, but God says we can do it. God gives us the Holy Spirit to do it. So Joel Osteen, shut your stupid mouth. <laughs> but that guy's going to be wealthy. I mean, he already is wealthy. Okay. Let's look at Revelation chapter 8. People like Joel Olstein will be preaching right into the tribulation. I guarantee it. He will still have, he will still be rich. He'll be wealthy. His hair will still look good. His teeth will still look white. He might have a scorpion bite him in the ass, though. I don't know. <laughs> We're going to find out. <laughs> Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. If we remember... We had six seals. The parenthetical chapter came in the middle that said people get saved during the tribulation period. 144,000 plus the Gentiles, the large host, right? Okay, so then the parenthetical chapter is done. Now we're in chapter 8. Yeah, okay, I just got to say something. Now, if you are a scorner, you are wondering how you can capitalize on the fact that Logan just said ass. Okay. I just want you to know. I'm speaking truth right now. I'm speaking truth right now. Is that you? Did I hit a, did I hit a winner? <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I got to testify. I got to testify, Sandra. It's going okay tonight, isn't it? <laughs> this is like bam, 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 bam. Just getting all this pressure. 
<laughs> seventh seal. The seventh seal comes in. The seventh seal is going to unleash a bunch of trumpets. And the trumpets aren't good things. The four trumpets we see in this chapter are terrible. The three trumpets after that are even worse. So this is real heavy judgment's going to fall. This is most definitely towards the latter part of the tribulation period, the great day of judgment. Okay, these are some bad things coming. Let's read it. 8, 1. And I saw the... Excuse me, 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of an hour. I'm not going to make the jokes about women in heaven and how could that ever be possible. I'm not that bad, okay? I'm going to go straight to the more the deep point, which says that in heaven we know the elders and the beasts, they are praising God nonstop. But here for a space of half an hour, whether that's literal or whether it's some other figure of time, I'm not quite sure. Nobody is. But for a space of time, heaven goes silent. It sounds almost like an awe or a wonder of what's going to come next or reverence for what's going to come next. Kind of in my mind, I picture kind of my house like when dad finally gets up his, off his lazy rear end and he's going to put the kids in trouble because they've been screaming and disobeying for an hour and he's finally going to stand up. Don't go there with the analogy with God and me. I'm saying my lazy rear run. But I finally stand up and I finally say something strong and then the house is still quiet. Okay, right? You're going to go to your room, you're going to get spanked. Well, God, holy, righteous God, his has been love and long suffering that's been holding back judgment. But at this point, he's going to stand up. He's going to stand up and judgment's going to fall. And all of a sudden, all the angels singing, all the elders singing, they stop. It is, a, it is an interesting passage to think about, pray about. That's how I always think I was getting the sense of it. Watch what happens too. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came out and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. The Bible many times talks about the prayers of saints as being incense that comes up before heaven. A neat thought, isn't it? It's a worship. Um, comes up before God. God sees it. God understands it. God hears our prayers. So there's a part of it there, whether those are prayers of saints that are on the earth during the tribulation, tribulation saints, or whether they're a bunch of prayers throughout time. I don't know. Four, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. A lot of little signs. Six, and the, seventh, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded. <clears throat> and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees were burned up. And all grass was burned up. A very exact total. Third part of the trees and all the grass was burned up. Uh, some cataclysmic judgment. I don't pretend to have all the answers. And we never know exactly when it's talking in like metaphors or not. But we do note that here it doesn't say things like the word like. It doesn't say like hail mingled with fire. So whatever it is, <laughs> uh, all we know is it very well could be something just like that. Right? Doesn't sound good. And then the numbers doesn't say it's a ballpark. It says a third. Sounds like cataclysmic judgment that's really going to mess up the earth. Eight. And the, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. It says the fire mingled with blood. A lot of blood in this chapter. Blood comes from people. Well, I guess animals too, but... Here it says there's a great mountain burning with fire. Almost sounds like some sort of volcano, doesn't it? Volcanic eruption causing things to shift and then all of a sudden it's into the sea. Hmm, could be the case. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. You think about the makeup of our earth. And of course, the evolutionist, big bang theorist, 
they try to pretend like that chaos is what started it all, right? From the chaos started everything. It's actually the chaos that's bubbling under the surface is what's going to bring it all to an end. Put in place by Almighty God is like a time stamp or a time ticking time bomb, right? Ever wonder why we have those big things called volcanoes sitting around this world? Ever played a video game and like you see something, and you're like, what is that for? And then later on you learn it's like the end of the game, it blows up or something. You're not geeks like I am. I'm sorry, Ramona. Sorry. Anyways, it's a one. We have a thing called what is it? Yellowstone. That's a big problem, isn't it, Sandra? <laughs> That's why you have to trust God with things. How do you prepare for something like that? <laughs> yeah, the whole ring of fire. Yeah, a third of the earth. Good point. Ring of fire. Okay, let's go down to. Uh, it says. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. It's messing the whole ocean up. Oceans up. Everything's dying in the water. I don't know how, why or how, but that's messing the, every, the whole ecosystem of the world up. A lot of things come from the water. 10, and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Some sort of star falls, some asteroid or something collides with earth. People talk about that all the time. A lot of these original cataclysmic things, you find them in scripture, right? People turn them into then fairy tales that make us overlook them. But one day this book is going to come true. It's not a fairy tale. This isn't just some poetic writing in, the, in scriptures. 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The whole earth is set off kilter. It's definitely not a Garden of Eden at this point. Everything's poisonous, bitter. 12, and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the waters, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Christ mentioned some stuff about that, signs in the heavens, earth being darkened. Hard to understand what it all means, but it just doesn't sound good, right? Sounds terrible. And you wonder, well, how could a loving God do this? Maybe a loving God wouldn't even do this. And then you have to read Genesis again and understand that God already did destroy the whole world with, with a flood. He covered the whole thing, the tops of the mountains, all the people, all the animals outside the ark. They all died, except for the fish, I guess. He's done it before. It's already in the Bible. You can't change history. You can't change the future. And then he said he wouldn't destroy it by a flood. So you don't see that here, right? See all kinds of other crazy cataclysmic judgments falling. 19, And I beheld and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. This angel flies through saying, wait till you see the next three trumpets. And they get really bad. This is a time, uh, great judgment. Christians certainly wouldn't want to be there and Christians won't be there. But those who live in the tribulation period, it will be terrible. I don't think we'll go, we'll save nine for next week. There's some separate things to talk about. We've got no time left anyways. If you look at, the only other thing I would say is that over in Luke, it does talk about some of the scenes in the heavens, which might pair up okay with this, might actually match is what I mean. It's in Luke 21 and 25. It says, And there should be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations and with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. That's Luke 21, 25. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the power of the heaven shall be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory.